When the makers of the black comic thriller Shallow Grave set about choosing locations to shoot their Edinburgh-based movie, they were faced with a classic filmmaker's dilemma. Whether to brave reality, which in this case included the vagaries of the Scottish climate and the costly problems of filming in a noisy, crowded city, or retreat to the controlled but artificial atmosphere of the studio, the choice was made even more difficult because most of the film's action takes place in one location, which had to have a very specific ambiance if the film was to work at all. Moving Pictures went to meet Shallow Grave's young director, producer, and production designer. Did they make the right decision or dig their own grave? I met a, a would-be writer, John Hodge, and um, he brought me this idea for a film script. He was very conscientious, unlike most script writers, that the film had to be made very cheaply. So he'd set most of it in one location, a flat. Shallow Graves are about three young, professional, well-to-do people in a, living in a flat in Edinburgh who advertised for a flatmate to take the fourth room. And um, they humiliate and abuse a number of people who turn up. Have you seen the flat? Yes. Do you like it? Yes, it's great. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yes. So tell me, Cameron, just tell me, because I'd like to know. What on earth could make you think we'd want to share a flat like this with someone like you? They eventually choose a guy called Hugo, who moves in, who's a novelist, supposedly. On the first night in the flat, he commits suicide in his room. He leaves a huge sum of money under the bed. They decide to keep the money and just bury the body. And the film follows what happens after that. I'm wasting a bit of light by bringing the left hand door in. We figured we'd need to spend about two thirds of our shooting time in the actual flat itself. Just give it clear, please. And I suppose the most important thing is we wanted it to be a flat worth dying for. In the early stages, I really thought, you know, I was going to have to make it for £150,000. I'd not made a film before. I can't ever imagine anybody um, going to give us the full whack. We imagined that we'd make it in a flat in Edinburgh by ourselves with our friends in 10 days. We spent quite a bit of time looking around trying to find the right place. Realised that it was going to be practically impossible to find the right um, uh, flat in actually in the Edinburgh Newtown area and also finding a flat that was big enough for us to film in, even though the flats are very big themselves. So we decided we had to do it on the studio. We created our own studio in this warehouse, um, which was cheaper than a real studio. We had the complete control in a studio atmosphere and um, it gives a very special feel to the film. 168, take one. The rooms are much bigger than a normal Edinburgh flat. We actually enlarge them by about a third to make it easier for filming. You could uh, position people within the set and distance them so you, in a small set you wouldn't have been able to do that or in a flat or a location. You wouldn't have been able to have separation of characters between rooms, in rooms and stuff like that. <laughs> Hello. Okay, good. Yeah, it should be on them until he gets here. Well, I'm sorry, but she's not she's not in right now. Uh no, I've got absolutely no idea. Um would you like to leave a message? When you're talking about the use of an of a, a, an interior interior space. I mean, Bertolucci's use of interior space is amazing. We 
looked at lots of photographs of his films and the way that he uses interiors. He'll often use three or four planes of existence in, in a particular flat, for instance. We also, we looked a lot at the Polanski films, the early Polanski films. I mean, he uses interiors in a different way. I mean, he's much more claustrophobic with his use of interior space. People don't want to really look at, you know, six by four rooms, you know. It, it works very well in a realist Ken Loach film, but it's not the type of film that we wanted to make. It's a sort of flat where you're supposed to want to live, but it's also supposed to feel slightly odd, but it doesn't come across, it doesn't hit you straight in the face as being really strange. So, like, things like um, figures with heads that have, you know, fallen off of them, like um, this statue here, or... Um, I don't know, strange props like this half torso line and stuff like that. And they're just like to, to remind me of, you know, the sort of overall feeling that I want to get across when I, when I was dressing the flat, the sort of props we wanted to use. I didn't want there to be lots of wallpapers and dressing and stuff like that. It's distracting you. Well, this, these colours are really nice, sort of bluey, whitey colours. And you remember those nice curved double doors that we saw in that house? So I thought the best way to do it was to have large expanses of plain colour. Danny sort of pointed out Edward Hopper, and you know we, we looked at that as a very good um, visual colour reference. We wanted the colours to actually um, be very um, seductive to the viewer, and we wanted to try to make people want to live there. But it is something very enviable, very desirable. We wanted to uh, evoke or awaken those kind of that kind of uh, avarice in in the watcher, really, because it's something that feeds through in the film. Can you afford this place? Oh yeah. Well, it certainly smells like the real thing. In these two spaces, given a little bit more money, we could have built like part of the forest, part of the back of the house, all sorts of things, very simply, very stylistically. Um, at the same time, you know, kept it within the realms of reality, um, which is something that you know used to be commonplace. An evocative tale of sexual repression set in a remote English convent high in the Himalayas, Black Narcissus is considered the epitome of British studio filmmaking. Through a skillful use of color, light, and design, director Michael Powell and producer Emmerich Pressburger were able to turn the backlots of Pinewood into the mountains of Nepal. I think my grandfather's films that do fascinate me. That's what movies are all about. And I would certainly like to do again a film that is very simply conceived, that can be made, created, and given that sort of feeling that only you can do in the cinema. If I was a more powerful filmmaker, I would definitely have done the whole film in the studio and stylized the whole film. But it's very difficult because the people who back the film obviously want wanted the film, and the script certainly has this potential to be a commercial film, to be attractive to a wide range of people. So you, it's very difficult to be able to push through those kind of very stylized decisions, though it certainly would have been very interesting. And what's, what's interesting now about looking at the film is that what you gain from the exterior world is very little. And that's a very curious feeling because you're making a film to be shown on a big screen, people want landscapes, they want air, and in fact, actually what gives this its landscape and its air is the inside of this flat, really. The idea of the set was that we would be able to move anywhere in it at any time and just float around this world, not necessarily just study the people, but float off into their environment whilst you continue listening to them in the background or whatever. The problem with that is that the sound of creaking floorboards has plagues us now, really.
it's been much more difficult than any actor could ever have been, you know. I'm sure that uh, the most temperamental actress in the world can uh, cause as many problems as a set. The set from hell. On one side, I'll feel quite happy, I must say, <laughs> to get rid of it. On the other hand, it's a, it's a huge waste. If I was half a producer, I'd be on the phone to Roger Corman, we'd be making five more movies on it. I mean, there is a lot of potential in that set. Shallow Grave opens here in the autumn. Looks promising.